Welcome to the latest edition of Out of the Mouth of Babes Bible Series. Today is Tuesday, um, July 28th. It's approximately um, 7 p.m. Central Time. And my name is Brother Brandon, and I will be bringing you a lesson today, as always, out of the Bible. Today's lesson is titled, Despise Not the Chastening of the Lord. I repeat, despise not the chastening of the Lord. And this is a lesson that the Lord allowed me to put together, um, not only for, you know, the benefit of others, but also for the benefit of myself. As I say all the time, you know, um, a lot of things that I teach or almost everything I teach, you know, it usually comes to me because I'm examining myself as the Bible likes to say, or I'm trying to get, make myself better, you know, and that's what the Bible urges us to do during this walk that we're walking, trying to become God. You have to constantly be able to look yourself in the mirror and be able to say, you're wrong, or you made a mistake, or I'm wrong, or I made a mistake, I should say. And not only accept that, but strive to do better. That's what the whole point of chastening is about. When the Lord is chastising anybody, he's trying to point you in the right direction that you should be going because that's the point of chastisement. That's the whole point of a parent chastising their child or whatnot, or anybody that's in a um, authoritative uh, position when they are disciplining you is not necessarily for their benefit, but it should be for the person who's getting the discipline benefit. And that's all the Lord is trying to do. He's trying to, keep you on the right path and keep you focused on the things that you need to be focused on. So, you know, that's something I do to myself. Um, that's something I can read in the Bible as I teach other people. I need to also be learning what I need to learn because I can only save myself. I can give information to any, to, to somebody or I can um, enlighten somebody in the scriptures in one form or another. But ultimately, like Paul said, if I don't control myself, I myself can be a castaway. And um, that's something that's very important to me. And that's one of the main reasons I started this YouTube page, not only to help others, but also keep me busy and keep me focused on the word of God and keep me active in the ministry. Um, we're going to, uh, I'm going to turn to Romans real quick. I want to find a scripture real quick because I, said something about, you know, me teaching and me benefiting from it as well, or me learning from it as well. And I remember quoting that or saying that before in a previous lesson. And as always, I don't like to repeatedly say things. I was told that, you know, when you say things out of the Bible, you know, it's best that you at some point or another read what you're saying. So nobody would think that, that, that you're, you know, misleading them in any way or another. So let's go to uh, Romans the second chapter. Romans, the second chapter. Now, this is not, this doesn't really have anything to do with the lesson. This is just something I want to read. Because this is my reasoning for, you know, trying to, or attempting to spread the gospel and share the little knowledge that the Lord has given me. Because I'm grateful for that knowledge. And I know that, you know, I'm not going to be like the wicked servant and hide my talent. I'm going to put them to use and hopefully it bring forth something beneficial to God. Cause that's who I'm ultimately trying to please. I'm not trying to please man or woman or anybody on this earth. I'm trying to please God for my benefit because I don't want to burn. Romans, the second chapter, like I said, this is not, this is not necessarily nothing to do with the lesson, but this is just something I want to read. Romans, the second chapter and when I get there, when I find it. Okay, I got it. Romans, the second chapter, and I'm going to start reading at verse 17. Romans 2 and verse 17. This is what Paul wrote to the Romans. Well, he's not necessarily talking to the Romans, but it's in Romans, I should say. Behold, thou art a Jew, and resteth in the law, and make it thy boast of God. So he's talking in reference to the Jews. So these would be Israelites. These wouldn't be Romans necessarily. He said, behold, thou art called a Jew and rested in the law. What does he mean? Rested in the law. He means, you know, 
you are in one form or another, you know, that's what you are um, living accord or, or living according to the law, as we all should be. You know, we should all understand and abide by the laws of God. That's the most important, like we read yesterday, that's the conclusion of the whole matter. That's the whole duty of man. Fear God and keep his commandments. I'm going to read that again. Though. Behold, thou art called a Jew and rested in the law and make it thy boast of God. So the people he's referring to, he's saying that, you know, you claim to know what you're talking about when you're talking about the Holy Scriptures. You're making your boast that, you know, this is what the Lord is saying. And that's what we are doing in a matter of speaking when we're preaching the gospel. We're doing like they did in the days of um, Nehemiah and them. They were reading the scriptures and the priest was giving a sense. And that's all preaching is, giving a sense. We're not making up no scriptures. I didn't write not one thing in this Bible. It may not be understood by other people. So that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to help people understand and recognize the importance of it. Then he goes on to say, and knoweth his will, and approveth thing, and approveth the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and art confident that thy that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness. So he's telling them, you confident that you know you're a preacher, you confident that you are you know benefiting other people by explaining to them what the Lord wants them to know. Then he goes on to say an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Thou therefore which teaches another, teachest thou not thyself? You see what he's saying? He's saying, so when you teach somebody else, you are, are you not learning? Are you not examining yourself? Are you not abiding to the things that you're telling somebody else? Or like the late Barry White used to say, I believe that was him, I'm not that old, but practicing what you preach. In other words, that's what he's saying right here. He said, uh, thou therefore, this is verse 21, thou therefore which teaches another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preaches a man should not steal. Does thou steal? So not only should we be attempting to spread the gospel, but we should be living according to the gospel. And we should be learning as well. We should be learning every day as well. The whole purpose of me doing this series is for me to stay active in the word of God, in the scriptures. Because without being active, you will easily be strayed away. Then he goes on to say, uh, verse 22, Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, does thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, does thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonoreth thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. So as we, as teachers, you know, are attempting to teach people out of the word or out of the law or out of the Holy Scriptures, out of the Bible, we should be also teaching ourselves. So that's what I was saying when I say a lot of the lessons that I give, especially the one I'm giving today, you know, this was something that I put together for my benefit, something that I had to examine myself and look at my own reflection in the mirror and bees and, and tell myself, you are an error. You are possibly not going the right way. So that's um, usually my purpose in most lessons I give. You know, I'm trying to grow in grace, just like I'm trying to teach other people to grow in grace as well. But I'm going to um, get back on topic because I know the time span of people is not that long. So I'm going to try to get this out the way as quick as possible. The title of today's lesson is Despise Not the Chastening of the Lord. I repeat, despise not the chastening of the Lord. And for those who don't understand what the word chastening represents, all it simply means is discipline, a, a form of discipline in one way or another. Just like you would chastise your child, God is going to chastise his servants because his servants, he views his children. You know, he calls each and every one of us who are striving to walk the right path, sons and daughters of God, for the most part. Well, I've never really read daughters of God, but, you know, that applies to both species, man and woman. So, uh, like I said, again, the title is Despise Not the Chastening of the Lord, because chastening is beneficial 
to the person that's being chastised, most importantly, especially when the Lord is doing it. Just like if a parent is chastising their child, they're not, that they shouldn't be at least doing it because they enjoy it. They should be doing it because they're trying to point their child in the direction they should go. They're trying to keep them on track, on the right path. That's the, that's the righteous chastisement that the Lord has given each and every one of us. Because without chastisement from God, we are going to be condemned. If God is not chastising you, he has given up on you. And we're going to see that plainly in the scriptures. The day that you aren't suffering for Christ's sake is the day you need to worry. So that's why the book says plainly, because this is where the title of the lesson comes from, out of the scriptures, despise not the chastening of the Lord. And it is very important that we understand that when we're going through hard times or we're suffering through something in one form or another, because all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. That's what the Bible pretty much lets you know. So like I said, again, the title was despise not the chastening of the Lord. And we're going to start off this lesson in Psalms 118. Psalms, the 118th chapter. Like I said, I like to always start in Psalms. You know, I grew up in a church where, you know, Psalms was read at the beginning of the Sabbath lesson. I don't necessarily um, pick a random one. I usually um, find one that goes with the topic at hand because, like I say all the time, Psalms is a big book, so it covers a variety of topics. Most topics that you can read in the Bible, you can read about in the Psalms. David was a great prophet, and, he, and the Lord spoke through David about a, numerous subjects. Numerous subjects. So, Psalms 118, and we're going to start reading at verse 16. Psalms, the 118th chapter, and I'm going to start reading at verse 16. Psalms 118 and verse 16. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord hath chastened me sore, but he hath not given me over unto death. So what is he saying right there? The Lord has chastened me sore, but have not given me over unto death. He's letting you know that. Through chastisement, God is saving him from eternal damnation, the lake of fire, what we kind of touched on in the lesson yesterday. God is trying to save you from that because the day that God stops trying to save you from that or stops chastising his servant or stop disciplining his children, then he's pretty much giving you over to Satan. And once that happens, you know, that's when... Words like reprobate and things of that nature come into play. And that's a scary position to be in, people. So that's why we can't get overwhelmed when we are going through hard times. Because hard times, suffering, persecution, tribulation can be extremely beneficial to the person that's going through it. Simply because it makes you consider, as the Bible said. It makes you... Think about your actions. Think about your thought process. It kind of realigns you with what you need to be focused on. And that's very important when you are trying to become God and be a good servant of God. You have to always be mindful of you continuing to grow in grace, as Paul say. So that's what he's saying right here at verse um. Set, well, verse 18, the Lord hath chastened me sore, but he hath not given me over unto death. That is a beautiful thing. Something that I can definitely relate to as of late. Cause, because me, like everybody else, in, in one form or another, is suffering. Is going through hard times. And that's a hard thing to deal with. But if you look at it the right way, then you will... Focus your attention on the things that you can control and the things that matters. So that's the good thing about chastisement. It focuses your mind on what's truly important. And ultimately, the only thing that's important is pleasing God and making it into his kingdom. 
Everything else is going to come to an end. Everything flesh and blood is concerned about right now is going to come to a swift end. So we have to always focus on the things that's going to be eternal. And that is living with Christ on earth when he fixes this wicked world that we are in today. So that's a, uh, that's what the prophet is trying to get you to understand. Let's go to uh, Proverbs, the third chapter. Proverbs, the third chapter. And this is where the title of the lesson actually comes from. Proverbs, the third chapter. And I'm going to start reading at verse 11. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord. That's the title of the lesson. Despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. So you can't come to a point where you saying, God, I don't want you to correct me no more. Or I'm over or, or, or you're overwhelmed or you're um, you know, or you're giving up. You can't do that. You can't get to that point. You have to always be able to reset and do better. Because that's what we hope for our kids to do. When we chastise our children, we hope that they go sit down somewhere, think about their actions, and correct them. And that's all the Lord is trying to do when he chastises us, or he persecutes us, or he allows certain things to happen to us in our day-to-day -day lives. He's trying to make us focus on what we need to do to better ourselves. I'm going to read that verse again. Verse 11. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth. So if the Lord is not correcting you, he doesn't love you. He has given you over to Satan. And that is a dangerous position to be in, people. Even as a father, the son in whom he delighted. So just like a father is going to discipline his son for his son's benefit, God is going to chastise you for your benefit. Because God don't need to change. God doesn't need to correct himself. God is perfect. God is righteous. We are the unrighteous people. We are, or I should say, the unrighteous species that needs correction, that needs guidance. So we have to be welcoming to the guidance that God is trying to give us, in other words. Let's keep going, though. Let's go to um, 1 John, the third chapter. 1 John, the third chapter. Because just like we just read in Proverbs, when God is chastising you, he are dealing, he, he's dealing with you as a parent would deal with their child. And it's out of love. It's out of love. It's not out of hate. A parent shouldn't chastise their child out of hate. They should chastise their child for their child's benefit and especially out of love. First John, the third chapter. And I'm going to start reading that verse one. It says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. So that's a, John said, that's the greatest love right there is to be called the son of God. Because ultimately, that's the only thing that's going to last forever. You know, your bank account, your job, your relationships with your wife, your kids, your family, that stuff is going to come to an end. That stuff is all going to come to an end. So you have to always keep that in mind that, you know, the only thing that lasts forever is my eternal soul, my eternal body that God is going to give me. Now, am I going to have my eternal body in hell with Satan, lake of fire? Or I'm going to live my eternal life with Christ Jesus and the Father. Because ultimately, like we read, God is going to wipe away all the pain when that happens. When it comes to that point, he said he's going to wipe away all tears from our eyes. So if we can just make it to that point, continue to learn, continue to grow in grace, accept the correction God has given us, then we'll be very benefited by it. Very benefited by it. I'm going to keep going, though. It said, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We shall see him as he is. That's the hope. To see Christ as he is. To be like him and dwell with him for eternity. 
Because the other side of that coin is dwelling with Satan for eternity, and you don't want the reward he got coming. His seal, uh, his fate is sealed already, and you don't want to share that fate with him. The lake of fire is real. So you want to make sure that you continue to be a child of God and not a servant of Satan or a child of Satan. That's what he's letting you know right here. And he says that verse three, every man that have this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. So that's what chastening is, chastening is ultimately supposed to cause you to do. It's supposed to cause you to purify yourself. And, and, and what does he mean purify yourself? He means um, make yourself better. Correct yourself. You know, um, stop the error of your ways for the most part. I'm going to read verse 2 again because that's going to kind of lead us to the next scripture. It said, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So now let's go to um, Hebrews, the 12th chapter, because everybody's not going to have that opportunity. Everybody's not going to see Christ as he is. Everybody's not going to live an eternal life with Christ in peace and happiness. That's not going to be the case for most people. Wide is the way and broad is the gate that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that find it. That's what Jesus said of his own mouth. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, and I'm going to start reading at verse 5. Hebrews 12 and verse 5 goes as, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord. The writer of Hebrews is simply quoting what we just read in Proverbs. Like I say all the time, you're not going to find much in the new that you're not going to find in the old. So he said, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Don't get bent out of shape. Don't do like Judas did and kill yourself. Because now there's no room for repentance. Now there's no room for growth. You know, you, you can't go through hard times and just throw in the towel and say, I'm not going to serve the Lord no more. That is a grave mistake you can make. And people do it every day. Because... You know, you get caught up with pain and you get caught up with persecution and you get caught up in tribulation and you don't see no way out of it. So you stop striving to be better. And that's what Satan is hoping that you do. He's hoping you do that. Just like he hoped Job would curse God when he when God allowed him to persecute Job a little bit. And Job was a righteous man. God was bragging on Job. We're going to read a scripture out of Job in this lesson, actually. But even Job being a righteous man had to suffer chastisement. And he suffered terrible chastisement. I mean, he lost almost everything. And he still maintained his integrity. And that's what we got to always remember that we are forced to do. Maintain our integrity, no matter what the Lord has taken us through. He goes on to say, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is whom the father chasteneth not? If the father is not, if a parent is not trying to correct their child, then they don't care much for that child. If, if your parent, I'm sorry, I'm sweating like crazy. If your parent is not trying to guide you in the right direction, then your parent doesn't care much about you. And that's very unfortunate. Well, if you're trying to serve God, God loves you. And he's going to try to continue to guide you in the direction he wants you to go. We go, uh, goes on to say, um, verse seven. I'm sorry, verse eight. But if we, but if ye be without chastisement, whereof are all partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Everybody's going to be chastised at one form or another until the Lord gives up on you. See, that's one thing I've learned from my teacher. Um, when everything is going good, you might need to work. You might need to really reevaluate what you're doing with your life because um, earning or receiving eternal life is a hard road. That is the hardest thing you're ever going to do in this lifetime. That's going. That's harder than becoming a doctor. That's hard to be to doing anything that seems to be uh, valuable in this flesh and blood body. Becoming God is the most difficult thing you're going to be, have to do because Satan has deceived the entire world and the entire world or Satan is using the entire world every day to make you 
give up on that hope or turn your back on God. So that's going to be difficult. That's going to be very difficult. He goes on to say, uh, well, I'm going to read verse 8 again. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us. We've all had a father for the most part that taught us the right path to go and corrected us when we made a mistake. And we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live? See, when you subject yourself to God, that's the only way you're going to live. When he's talking about live, he's talking about live life eternal, people. Then he goes on to say, um, For they verily, for they verily for a few days chasten us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers unto his holiness. God is doing this for our profit, not for his benefit. He's already righteous, like I said. He doesn't need correction. He doesn't need guidance. We are the wicked species. We need correction. We need guidance. We are the ones considered unworthy. So he's just trying to break us down. Like a, one of my teachers said recently, he's going to tear you down to make you beneficial to him. Ultimately goes on to say, uh, what verse am I at? Verse 11. This is very important. Now, no chastening for the present seeming to be joyous, but grievous. So you got to expect that. You, the Lord is not going to chastise you and you're going to like it. Discipline is not something you enjoy, but it can, but it's ultimately something that can be beneficial if you can if you view it the right way and you learn from it. Nevertheless, afterward it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. So don't get bent out of shape, don't get weary. Don't oh, this is too much. Nah, you can't get it like that. You have to examine yourself and find ways to be better, do better, think better, speak better. Because that's what God is demanding of us, to be better with every day. Um, Where am I at? Verse 13. And make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Because what he means, if it's lame be turned out of the way, the Lord is going to turn his back on you. He's not going to guide you into eternal life anymore. And he goes on to say, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. So we have to do like the writer right here is saying at verse uh, 12, uh, or verse 11, he, when he said, now no chastening for the present seeming to be joyous but grievous, nevertheless, Afterward, it yielded peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. We have to allow it to help us grow and be better and do better with the fruits of the spirits. Ultimately, that's what it's all about. Pleasing God. And he's going to constantly do things in your life. And it's going to be bad in a lot of cases to make you focus on pleasing him. And, and we have to be welcoming of that. We can't despise that. That's why that's the title of the lesson. We can't despise that. Let's go to Ecclesiastes, the seventh chapter. Ecclesiastes, the seventh chapter. It is hot down here. I have to cut my AC off because it's kind of loud. That's why I'm going to probably be shining because I'm going to sweat a bit. Ecclesiastes, the seventh chapter. And um, I'm going to start reading at verse 3. Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 3. It says, Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. So that's what the Lord is trying to ultimately do. He's causing sorrow in each and every one of our lives because that's going to make our heart better. When he means heart, he means your mind. This is the heart that God speaks about. In the Bible, he's not talking about this thing pumping blood in your chest. This is what guides you. This is what controls you for the most part. This is where sin is conceived ultimately. So when you are sorrowful or you're going through hard times, that fixes this. 
that fixes your mind. I'm going to read that again. Sorrow is better than laughter. For by sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. But the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. Like I said before, if everything is going good and everything is happy-go-lucky and your life is perfect, too blessed to be stressed, as people like to say all the time, you need to worry. Because you may be deceiving your own selves to thinking that you got it together. And once you do that, you are making a grave mistake. That's what the Bible says and means. And it said, um, he who think he standeth, take heed lest he fall. And the Lord is not going to allow you to think that you just got it together because none of us have it together. None of us is ready to be God at this day and age. That, that's a growing process. That's a lifelong building process. So we should be welcoming to the chastisement or the heartache or the pain or the sorrow because that's going to make us, in other words, like the Bible say, Consider our ways. And as long as you're considering your ways, then you can constantly be better and do better. Once you stop considering, once you stop examining your, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Once you stop examining yourselves, the Bible says that's reprobate. You know, you think you got it together and you can't be told nothing. Now you have become what Jesus called an old bottle. And you can't put new wine in old bottles. An old bottle can't be taught anything. And that's a grave position to be in because that ultimately is a position that's going to lead you to the lake of fire. Let's keep going. We're going to read what I said about in Job. Let's go to Job, the 34th chapter. Job, the 34th chapter. And um, if I'm correct, this is uh, one of Job's friends, Elihu, that was talking um, to him. And what he said is a true statement, but ultimately it didn't apply to Job. But it was a true statement. It was a true statement that we should all recognize to be true. He didn't say anything wrong. He just applied it to the wrong person. That's why the Lord ultimately made him go back and apologize to Job. But this is a very true statement we're finna read right now. Job, the 34th chapter. And I'm going to read verse um, 31. Job 24, uh, 34 and 31. Surely it is me to be said unto God, I have borne chastisement. I will not offend anymore. What is he saying right there? When he said it is meat, that means it is fitting. That's what meat means in this situation. It is fitting for you to say, I have borne chastisement. Like the, we read in Jeremiah, it is better. I think that was Jeremiah. Um, I might be wrong. It might be Jeremiah Lamentations, one of those scriptures, when it says um, something along the nature of, it's better that you bear, um, it's better that you, because um, you can build off that. You can learn from that. So that's what he's trying to say right here pretty much. He says, surely it is meet to be said unto God, I have borne chastisement. I will not offend anymore. Because that's what chastisement is ultimately trying to make you do. Well, that's the godly chastisement. He's trying to get you not to offend him anymore. Because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So he's going to chastise us so we can stop doing that. And we're going to get a good example of that later on in this lesson. He goes on to say, um, That which I see not, teach thou me. If I have done iniquity, I will do no more. That's what chastising is doing. It's supposed to be a teaching tool to stop being evil, to stop being wicked, to stop doing things that the Lord plainly is telling you that you shouldn't. Your thought processes should be filled with the fruits of the spirit. And that is going to ultimately cause you to make it into the kingdom. But when you get off track of that, now you are putting yourself in a situation where you might not make it into the kingdom. And that's the benefit of chastising because it's going to constantly take you back to the basics. Like, okay, hold on. Wait, wait. This is happening for a reason. I'm going through this for a reason. How can I utilize this as a tool to be a better servant to God? That's what he's saying right here. How can I utilize this heartache, this sorrow, this pain, this tribulation to make me better? And that's the beauty of it. But as always, it's a, 
It's a struggle to go through. But just like Jesus went through what he went through, we can get through it as well. And we got to remember that when we're going through it. Like I said, we can't be like Judas and throw in a towel and hang yourself. You know, I don't think he had much chance anyway because he was prophesied to not make it. But still, though, you know, that is not the approach to take when you're going through hard times. You cannot throw in a towel. You can't get weary with chastisement, as we read. But we're going to um, get a good example of that. Great example of that. Um, let's go to Acts, the seventh chapter. Acts, the seventh chapter. Acts 7. And I'm going to read verses 58 and 59. And then we're going to got, um, jump right into the eighth chapter and continue on. And this is about Paul. Paul, the apostle. Paul, the preacher to the Gentiles who did great things for the gospel. Great things for the gospel. But he had to endure chastisement because he had to be corrected as well. Acts, the seventh chapter. And I'm going to start reading that verse 58. Acts 7 and 58. And just pay attention to the situation that was going on. It says, um, Acts 7 and 58, it said, uh, Oh, uh, okay. Well, this is, uh, give you a little background, uh, uh, a little backdrop of what's going on right now, because I'm not going to read up into it. Um, the, um, the Apostle Stephen was being stoned at this time by some wicked people for, do, for, for preaching the gospel for the most part. And um, anybody that knows the story of Paul, who was at this time called Saul, was on the other side. Uh, or he was actually one of the ones in uh, agreeing with, you know, the stoning of a righteous man. And and he had to pay for that. He had to pay for that. He, he was corrected for his actions by God later on. I'm going to start at verse 57. I'm going to start at 57 instead. It said, then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. This is the people... That's uh, attacking Stephen at this time and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. So as they were stoning him, they were, oh, hold this, hold this. Oh, I'm, give my jacket, hold my jacket. You know, like that, like, like we said, now hold my phone. That's what they was pretty much doing. And they stoned Stephen calling upon God saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So this righteous man right here, this righteous brother right here, his last words was trying to benefit the people that was actually killing him. So that should just show us the mindset we should have when we thinking that we are righteous. Are you going to be praying for the person that's trying to kill you? Probably not, but guess what? You should be because your life, my life, everybody's life going to come to an end at one point or another. And if you die for Christ's sake, then you know what the reward of that is. The reward for that is eternal life. You know, that's that's ultimately the, the, the goal, right? So if you care for your neighbor or you care for your brothers and sisters that you come across, you shouldn't want to see them suffer damnation. You shouldn't want to see them, you know, find themselves in a lake of fire. You know, you shouldn't wish that upon nobody. So a true servant is going to appeal to the their God or to God for even their persecutors. And that's what Stephen did. But we're going to keep going into the eighth chapter, like I said. Because he's going to start talking about Paul now. Or at the time, his name was Saul. It goes on to say, and Saul was consenting unto his death. So Saul was cool with it. He was like, yeah, do it to him. Do blaspheming. Do it to him. Because Saul didn't understand what Jesus meant according to the word of God. He, he didn't understand the importance of Jesus. You know, they was caught up in the mindset like a lot of people caught up in, you know, ain't nobody got to die for me. And, you know, they didn't want to accept Jesus as the Messiah for the most part. So it says in verse one again, and Saul was consenting unto his death 
And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So the church was being persecuted at this time. They was being chased out of town for the most part. And, uh, it, and it said, and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation uh, over him. So they, so they was broke up over that. But then it goes on to say, as for Saul, he made havoc on the church. <laughs> he made havoc. He ain't stopped with Stephen. He kept it pushing. You can read the story on your own. I mean, he was chasing, he was chasing Israelites, or, or not Israelites. He was chasing the apostles and the servants of God or, 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 or the followers of Christ as far as Damascus. You know, he was on his way to Damascus when the Lord um, got his attention. And that was a city quite a bit north of our land. You know what I mean? So it says at verse three again, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women committed them to prison. He was locking people up. He was condemning people to death. That's what he was doing. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. So this was, this was Paul's manner. He was persecuting the church that was following Christ. He was doing this. He was doing this. Let's go to uh, 1 Timothy, the first chapter, because he understood that later. He was, he was corrected. He was shown the error of his ways by none other than Jesus. But being showed the error of his ways wasn't enough. See, see, with mercy, I, I'm, I have people say that all the time, you know, everybody want to everybody wanna harp on mercy. You know, people want to harp on mercy when they do something intentionally that they know they shouldn't do. You know, oh, uh, uh, I'm hoping the Lord have mercy on me. I'm hoping the Lord have mercy on me. Yeah, you know, a lot of bad stuff come with mercy. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't see, I don't read much mercy in the Bible with a harsh form of chastising or, or, or without a harsh form of chastising. Yeah, I want mercy, but I would rather not do what I sh shouldn't do to be in need of it because mercy just never comes free. Mercy usually come with the hammer. And that's what Paul understood. He understood that. The Lord showed him that. Trust and believe. Um, what I say, first Timothy, the first chapter, and I'm going to read a couple verses here, starting at verse 12, first Timothy one and verse 12. Um, this is Paul speaking right here. He said, and I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me for that. He counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Then he goes on to say, who was before a blasphemer. He's talking about himself. He was a blasphemer. At, while he was persecuting uh, the servants of Christ, the followers of Christ for being blasphemer, he was actually the one in error. He just didn't, he wasn't aware of it. So he said, um, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. See, that's why he obtained mercy, because he was actually believing the way of the Pharisees was, or he was believing that the way the Pharisees was teaching you to be was the correct path to go about. And that was not the correct path to go about. Jesus said out of his own mouth, if your righteousness don't surpass theirs, you ain't got nothing coming. But they took that as a shot, you know what I mean? And they persecuted Christ and ultimately killed Christ, because his ways was against their own. So Paul was just doing what he was raised up to do. So he was actually ignorant of the mistakes he was making. And he obtained mercy and his mercy came with some stripes, people. I mean, his mercy came with some stripes. You can read about Paul in your own time. I can't read it all. We're going to read a little bit about the things he tells you to look forward to with mercy. But he went through some stuff. I mean, in prison, he's been stoned. I mean, he was stoned, dragged out of town, and they thought he was dead. See, that's what came with his mercy. And he got that type of punishment, you know, because of an ignorant sin. So you think we're going to get something light for a presumptuous sin? No. We got to do better, people. I'm going to read that again, though. Verse 13. It says, uh, who was before a blasphemer? He's talking about himself a persecutor, and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly 
and unbelief. He did it ignorantly. Now let's go to Acts the ninth chapter. Back up to Acts the ninth chapter. And I'm going to start reading at verse 11. Acts the ninth chapter. And uh, this is when Paul was actually being converted to the, to the righteous path at this time. It says, and the Lord said unto him, uh, the Lord's talking to Ananias at this time, arise and go into the street, which is called straight and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarshish. For behold, he prayeth. Little backdrop, the, the, Paul was on his way to Damascus to persecute some more servants of Christ. And the Lord blinded him and he was praying for his sight back. He was praying to figure out what was going on. So the Lord sent Ananias to him, but he's telling him about, he, he's giving Ananias instructions, I should say. And he has seen in a vision, I'm at verse 12, a man named Ananias coming in, putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Now pay attention to what Ananias said. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard many of this man. How much evil he have done to thy saints at Jerusalem. So then I was like, you sending me to who? <laughs> like, man, I, I ain't trying to deal with this guy. This guy, this guy is something else, Lord. He out here locking us up and having us condemned to death. Why you want me to go over there and talk to him? He ain't, he ain't one of us, in other words. But, but pay attention to what the Lord had to say. Uh, uh but no, no, Ananias is still talking here. I, I'm sorry, verse. 14. He's going to tell you some more about Paul. He said, and here he had authority from the chief priest to bind all that called on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. That's what the Lord told Ananias about Paul. He said, nah, nah, you go on and do it. Do what I told you to do. Don't worry about him. I already put him in this place. Jesus had already blinded him. He ain't a threat no more. I got him. I got a job for him. But along the way of him doing his job, I'm going to show him. He said, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So Paul wasn't getting a mercy without chastisement. Oh, no, he was getting, he was, the Lord said it in the beginning, he going to suffer great things. And Paul suffered a lot for an ignorant sin. For an ignorant sin, he suffered great chastisement from God. Now, let's see how he took his chastisement, because that's how we are supposed to take it. That's how we are supposed to view it. Let's go to 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. 1 Corinthians 11, and I'm going to read uh, one verse here, verse 32. Pay attention to what Paul had to say about chastisement. It's what I was uh, alluding to earlier when I first opened up this lesson. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 32, it says, But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. So the Lord is the right to judge. He's judging your actions, whether they're right or wrong. So that's what Paul is saying. When we are judged... We are chastened of the Lord because we've all done wrong. We've all done wrong. But I'm going to read it again. I'm sorry. But when we got judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. See, the world is, is going to suffer condemnation. What is condemnation? The lake of fire. So ch chastisement in this flesh and blood body is Something that God is, get, is trying to give you in place of eternal condemnation. See, Paul understood that. I'm read that again. He said at verse 32, But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. So, so we can't get bent out of shape when hard things are going on in our lives and we're suffering loss or we're going through persecution or tribulation. We are being judged and chastened by the Lord, and we need to utilize that as Utilize that as a tool to avoid eternal condemnation, people. See, Paul understood that. He understood what he went through was needed to be used as a tool for him to be a better servant to Christ. That's it. That's all. That's it. That's all. Let's go to the second Corinthians, the sixth chapter. Second Corinthians, the sixth chapter. 
And I'm going to start reading that verse 1. This is Paul talking here again. Because like I said, he suffered great things for Christ. Just like Christ said he was. He suffered great things. Great things. 2 Corinthians 6. And I'm going to start at verse 1. It goes as follows. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you, beseech you also that we... I'm sorry. I'm going to start the other one. We then, as workers together with him... Beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. See, you can get grace from God and all, like I said, all grace is, is the time to get your life in order. You don't want to receive that in vain. You don't want to waste that, in other words, what is he saying? For he said, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. But in all things, approving ourselves as ministers of God in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses. You hear the things Paul saying that you must deal with? I'm going to read that again. But in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes. That's beatings, people. Beatings. Paul said he got 40 strikes twice. He might have said it three times. I don't want to misquote it. At verse 5, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor. So you got to be able to accept both. You're going to get a little bit of both as you go through this walk with Christ, as we like to say. You, it's not Everybody's not going to honor you. Everybody's not going to be pleased with you. So, so, so you should be able to deal with both sides of the coin. You should be able to endure that. Verse 8 again, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true. What does he mean by as deceivers and yet true? People are going to call you a false prophet, in other words, or a liar when you try to do the right thing or show them the right thing to do according to the word of God. But you are true, though. But that's what you won't have to endure. He said, as unknown and yet well known. As dying, and behold, we live. This might ultimately, your chastisement might ultimately end in your death, people. Stephen's chastisement ended in his death. But what did he say? And behold, we live, though. That's what he's letting you know. Because if you die righteously, then you're going to live forever. We'll start that again at verse 9. As unknown and yet known. Oh, I'm sorry. As unknown and yet well known. As dying, and behold, we live. As chastened and not killed. See, that's the beauty of chastening. God is not killing you. God can kill you. And this is not talking about necessarily the, the first death. The ultimate death that we try to avoid is the second death, the lake of fire. As chastened and not killed, as sorrowful. What, is, what do we read about sorrowful? The sorrow countenance make the heart better. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing as poor, yet making many rich. Because see, your suffering can lead to somebody else seeing that and they becoming rich in righteousness, not rich in money. Ain't nobody worried about no money. So that's what he's talking about. As poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing all things. That's what we are striving toward. And the only way we can get to that point is not to despise the chastisement that the Lord is going to put upon us in our lives. Whenever it comes, whatever you're going through, whatever it seems you may feel like you are suffering, learn from it. Examine yourselves and do better and figure out a way to be a better servant to Christ. And I hope you guys understand in Jesus' name. Till next time.